Are developing countries and emerging markets facing financial disorders and development troubles? Can the extension of TPP replace free trade area of Asia Pacific? Some countries hyped adding the South China Sea issue into the APEC agenda. Why hasn't it turned into reality? Welcome to China Mosaic. Today's China Mosaic will discuss hot issues about G20 and the APEC summit. As in every APEC informal meeting, leaders from different countries will wear uniform casual clothes designed by the host nation, indicating that all members are working together to build a harmonious and inclusive Asia-Pacific family. Likewise, we will start our program today with the key phrase inclusive growth, which is also a common core issue of the two summits this year. Why inclusive growth? Inclusive growth means growth for all the countries, both developed and developing countries, both big and small countries. In the country, both for rich and poor people, for rural and uh, urban areas as well. Especially this year, the world economy has experienced further vulnerable recovery. The IMF's recent estimate for 2015 GDP growth has been revised down to only 3.1%, even lower than last year. So just one year ago, the G20 Brisbane Summit set an ambitious goal of lifting world GDP growth by 2% within five years. Now, just one year has elapsed, the world growth seems drifting away from that goal. So it is imperative to lift the growth, but growth should have realized for all the countries for developing countries, they have different difficulties because of the fall of the world oil prices and the commodity price, and also because of strength of the dollar. So many developing countries are experiencing serious difficulties. So in order to have inclusive growth, we should have a strategy for all of them. So the world growth strategy should not be designed by the developing, developed countries, by G7 only but by all the countries involved, both developed and developing countries. China has made great efforts to stabilize global economy, making significant fundamental contribution to realize the inclusive growth. The 13th five-year plan of China fully embodies the inclusive growth and pledges that the existing poverty-striking population of 70 million will all be out of poverty by 2020. Many of China's proposals have been adopted by G20. It is reported that China's contribution rate to the agenda of the 2015 G20 summit is 15%. China is the world's second largest economy, so its economic growth, no matter accelerates or slows down, attracts worldwide attention. Also, voices dampening down the prospect of Chinese economy have never been muted. So, will the world really be dragged into a new mire by China's economic downturn? China's growth, although it's going down from the past two-digit growth, is still pretty high in the standards of world-leading economies. This year, we will have 7% or close to 7% growth because China accounts for 13.3% of total world GDP. So, 7% growth will make 0.9 percentage point contribution to total world growth, which is only 3.1 percent. That means China will make 30 percent contribution, the world's largest. Second, massive investment in infrastructure, because that is the strong wheel pushing world economy forward. China has proposed a one belt and one road initiative. That means massive investment in infrastructure and also initiated the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank and uh, New Bricks Development Bank and Silk Road Foundation, all in this direction, which will, will be tremendously helpful. We all have noticed uh, that the piece of news that by November the 30th, the expert group of IMF will come out with a con recommendation to include the renminbi into the SDR basket of IMF, if realizes, then it would be not, not only be a milestone for renminbi, but also a milestone for the world monetary system, because China is a world leading merchandise trading country, which has the extensive trade investment relations with many countries in the world. So renminbi's inclusion would facilitate 
trade payment, settlements, and the reserve for many countries. And it also means China's market headways in capital market liberalization, which will also facilitate world inclusive growth. This October, 12 countries, including the United States, reached the basic agreement on TPP. However, the construction of free trade area of Asia-Pacific, one of the core issues of this summit, is still under its strategic research, which will last until the end of next year. China is excluded from TPP, and it is said that the free trade area of Asia-Pacific will also be replaced by TPP if the letter extends to contain other members of APEC. I don't agree with that, because first, FTAP has 21 economies, TPP has only 12, and the rest of nine economies have different situations and conditions. It should recognize differences, because all the 21 economies have different situations, and they are at different levels of development. So the future FTAP should recognize differences, not simple so-called high standard TPP. Before the APEC summit, the United States claimed to discuss the South China Sea issue in addition to the formal agenda, which triggered heated discussion in Western media. While meeting with leaders from other countries during the G20 summit, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe also expressed concerns about China's activity in the South China Sea. However, as the host nation, the Philippines has repeatedly asserted that the agenda won't involve the South China Sea issue. Chinese President Xi Jinping hasn't made any comment on this territorial dispute in the APEC summit as well. The United States wants very much to insert it into that agenda, which is certainly wrong, because APEC is an economic organization, non-sovereign state organization. It is not uh, appropriate to put the sovereign state discussion into this platform. South China Sea, according to international law, any disputes involving sovereign states should be discussed by all the sovereign states bordering the sea. So if one of the countries does not agree, for instance, China does not agree, this conference should not be held. And point two, any countries out of the region, for instance, the United States is not a country bordering South China Sea, is not qualified to discuss. So this issue will certainly be excluded in APEC summit. Take the Philippines, for example. Philippines' bilateral trade with China last year was 44 billion, with its export 21 billion, while its bilateral trade volume with the United States was only 18.6 billion, which with its export only one billion, much smaller. So we should focus on expansion of trade, expansion and pushing forward on our connectivity, free trade arrangement for economic integration so as to have lift our growth in the other region, so as to have inclusive growth benefiting all the peoples and for the common prosperity. Thank you for watching.